And theorem eight's a very natural theorem. Um, it's one of the ones where it's like, do we really have to prove this? And the answer is, yes, we really have to prove it because if you don't know that something's um, then it's not really safe to use it, right? So here, we go. if you have two different numbers and if you add the same thing to both sides, you maintain that inequality, right? So it's pretty obvious, but we just have to work through it to make sure it always holds. Um, there's a really interesting uh, example where this type of silly little thing actually turned out to make a big difference where um, apparently um, there's a really famous proof back in the 90s where the person who was proving it is just some silly little thing like this that they needed to check and verify. Does it really satisfy this property? And they said, oh yeah, of course it does. It's obvious, right? And then it turns out that the tools that he was using, they didn't satisfy the property that he thought they did. It was just some silly little thing like this. And the whole proof came crumbling down because of it. So, you know, that's just the way math goes, is that if you don't check these things, the whole thing's gonna, gonna crumble, right? So, um, if, and how do we set it up here, y is not z, then adding the same thing to both sides maintains that inequality. So, we've seen how that axiom five it is the main tool that we have for proving things about the naturals, right? Because once you prove something holds for one, and once you prove that it holds for successors, axiom five k kicks in and it says, if you've done those two things, you've done it for all natural numbers, right? So that's the real power of axiom five. And so anything like this, it doesn't even necessarily look like induction, right? But anything you see like this, where you're trying to prove something for all natural numbers, that should be your go-to thought is how can I get axiom five in here, right? So all that we do is we say, um, let's let x be such that this property holds. I guess we'll say let m be all x Let m be all the x's where starting with an inequality, addition maintains that inequality, addition by the same number. So we don't really know much about m at this point, but we'd like to, to see if one might be one such number, right? And so what do we do? We just say, assuming that this is true, assuming that that's true, we want to show that um, one plus y is different from one plus three. Question? Yes, exactly, right? Yeah, exactly, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to combine all the previous theorems and, and prove this. But yeah, we have to, um, we haven't proved this exact property yet. We proved it for successors, but we haven't proved it for this addition yet, right? So we're going to prove that it holds any time you have um, y plus x or z plus x. And um, I noticed that I switched what Landau has. So I'm, in, in my statement, I'm going to switch it back to what Landau has. He has the x's on the left. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter because we've already proved the commutative law, which says you can switch the order, right? But just to be consistent with how Landau wrote it, I'll just switch it back like that. All right. So how can we verify this? All that 
we really have to do is recall that if y is not equal to z, then y successor is not equal to z successor. And this was true by a theorem that we proved way back in the day called theorem 1. Okay, theorem 1 says if you have two different numbers to start, then the successors remain unequal. Okay. And so, what we have then is let's rewrite y successor and z successor using plus 1 notation. y successor is certainly the same as 1 plus y, and z successor is certainly the same thing as 1 plus z. And therefore, assuming that y and z are different, then when you add 1 to both sides, the results remain different. And now that we've verified that it holds true for 1, now we want to verify it for any element of M that the successor to that element will, will um, maintain non-equality, right? So, by definition, if x is in m, then it's one of those elements where you can add it to both sides of an inequality and maintain inequality, right? If um, x is in m, then what we have is x plus y is different from x plus z. That's just the definition of what M was, right? We said, let M be all the X, where whenever you have um, two different numbers, then adding X maintains that inequality. For x successor, what we can do is we can rewrite this left-hand side, x successor plus y. As x plus y successor. That was the definition of addition, right? And we also have that um, this right-hand side, when we consider x successor, the right-hand side is going to become x successor plus z. And you can rewrite that as x plus z successor. Again, by definition of addition. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start to compare these two terms, okay? The inductive assumption guarantees that x plus y is different from x plus z. And theorem 3 guarantees that if you have two different elements, then the successor to those elements will also be different. The 
so. There we go. Let's put all these things together. Successor to x plus y is really the same thing as this. And by the previous line, we know that this thing is different from x plus z successor. All right, that's what we concluded here. We said if these things are different, the inductive assumption says these things are different, then theorem, sorry, not theorem three, theorem one guarantees that the successors will remain different. So these have to be different. And this is really the same thing as x, x successor plus z. by definition of addition. And so what have we verified? We said this thing cannot be the same, right? We have this big chain right in the middle. We say these things cannot be the same. by this big chain of, um, of statements here. This is the same as this, but this is not the same as this. But this is the same as this. So what that says is that since these things differ, these things have to also differ. Okay, so what have we done? We know that one is an element for which, when you have two different elements, you can add one to both sides, and they'll stay different from each other, right? And all successors to elements are in M, right? So what does that say? It says, if one is in M, and pick up any element in M, and the successor will be in M, then that says that all natural numbers are such that if you start with two different numbers and add the same number to both sides, the result gives you two different numbers as well. Okay. Yep. All naturals satisfy the property. But if you start with two different things, and you add a natural to each side, then the sum is also two different things. Okay, any other questions? So theorem 9 you know it's it's really interesting sometimes in math the theorem is more important than the proof and other times in math the proof is more important than the theorem um, this is one of those cases where the theorem is much much more important than the proof okay the proof to this theorem, very unpleasant. I'll just tell you that right now. Um, so I'm ready to, to handle some, some grumbling here. Um, but the, the theorem itself is very, very critical. So um, there's a good chance you'll get stuck in the proof. And if that's, a, if that's the case, it's OK. Um, it's sort of optional. If you want to work through this proof and really master this material, which I hope is everybody. Um, you're welcome to do that, but I'm not really going to test you on this particular proof. Um, so I encourage everyone to go through and uh, reread it and rewatch the video. But it's not one of those proofs where I expect you to really master it. Okay? But the theorem itself is hugely critical 
to order. The whole next section, section three in Landau, it's all about ordering, okay? And it all boils down to this one little theorem right here, okay? So the statement you really need to understand. So if x and y are natural numbers, then one and only one of these conditions must be true. So these are, con these are the conditions here. I'll write them out in a second. The first case is that you pick up any two natural numbers. Well, it could be that you picked up the same natural number, right? So x could be the same as y. Let me just make sure I follow Landau's setup here. x could be y plus u. So that's the second possible case. And the third possible case is that maybe y is x plus b. So just a little foreshadowing here. What's the relation between x and y if equation true happened to be true? Equation two. Say. That's, that's a very good point. X would definitely be different from Y because you're adding a natural number. Natural numbers are never zero, right? So if you're adding two natural numbers, you always get something different, right? So it's absolutely guaranteed that um, X and Y can be the same thing because you're taking Y and you're adding something to it to get X, right? So X and Y definitely have to be different. I like that. Uh, not quite. I like how you're thinking. In opposite land, yeah, yes, right. Because take a look at yeah, take a look at the says it says to to get from y to x you have to go further, right? So this says x is greater than y. Okay, so we're going to talk about those ordering relations later on, but that's why this is so important to ordering is because what this says it says either you have the same number, or x has to be greater than y, or y has to be greater than x. One of, those th one of those three things has to be true. So let's first focus on this key phrase right here that says one and only one of these conditions can be true at any given time, right? Can it be that you're both equal, that you have both x equals y and also x is greater than y? Can those be true simultaneously? No. no. And can it be that you're 
greater than y and x is also less than y? Of course not, right? So it's pretty obvious. When you think in terms of inequalities, which is sort of a sin at this point because we haven't introduced inequalities, but when you think in terms of inequalities, we see that, yeah, only one of these can happen simultaneously, but we have to prove it, right? And so let's go ahead and recall theorem 7. Theorem 7 said, suppose you have y, and suppose you add x to y, then it must be, just like you mentioned, that um, this has to be an inequality. Because if you have y and then you add something to it, you're certainly not going to get y back, right? Okay. So now what we'll do, we're going to apply this theorem, and we're going to say, assume that case 1 is true. And now what we'll do, this may sound kind of silly, we'll assume that case 2 is also true. So we're literally assuming that x is the same as y, and we're simultaneously assuming that x is also larger than y, which sounds nonsensical, right? And we're going to show that it really is nonsense, okay? So if case 2 is true, that says that x is equal to y plus u. Okay? Let me start fresh over here. Then in this equation, we know that since x equals y, we can substitute um, x in for y. All right, we take this equation. Let's just take that equation and substitute x in for y. This equation can't happen by theorem 7. That's nonsense, right? If you assume case 1, that x is the same as y, and assume case 2, that x is greater than y, then just by a quick little substitution, you get something that in this system can't happen because theorem 7 said that based on the five axioms that we have, this behavior cannot happen. So in case 1 and case 2, you get this nonsense here. And so that says that case 1 and case 2 can't happen simultaneously. have one, you can't have the other, and vice versa.
All right. Now let's assume that cases one and three hold. Now most of you guys could already bust through the proof that this is nonsense pretty quickly. We're assuming that x is equal to y, and also that y is greater than x. And we know that's nonsense, right? So what we're going to do is combine those two equations and show that we get some nonsensical statement, right? So 1 guarantees that x is equal to y, and 3 guarantees that y is equal to x plus v. So wherever we see an x, we can replace it with a y. And we get this equation, y is equal to y plus v. And this can't happen, once again, by theorem 7. And so 1 and 3 can't happen simultaneously. So now, we know that 1 and 2 can't occur simultaneously. We know that 1 and 3 can't occur simultaneously. Now we need to show that 2 and 3 can't occur simultaneously. If we weren't pressed for time, this would be a perfect point to stop and let you guys try this one. Because this is, I think a lot of people would get how to do this. Oh man, I'm so tempted. But the last part of this proof is kind of lengthy. So I think we should just break through this um, and uh, I'll just have to, well, I mean, we're going to do it in class. So now that you guys are going to see it, it's going to be can be pretty clear after that. So um, equation two says um, x equals y plus u. And equation three says y is equal to x plus v. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume, assume that these occur simultaneously. We assume that they do, and then we arrive at nonsense, and we say, see, if you assume that they occur simultaneously, you get a nonsensical system, so we throw that out, okay? Yeah, exactly, we say, yeah, yeah, exactly, you say, assume it's true, hey, guess what, you get a nonsensical system, so, you know, we don't want to have that in our system, we, if we get nonsense, we, you know, we throw out that property that says two and three are allowed to be the same, right? So, assume that these are both true. Right? And now we're going to show that if they're both true, you get a nonsensical system. And so we exclude that from our system. Okay? So if they're both true, then what we can do is x is certainly equal to y plus u. That's true by assumption 2. And now what we can do, we can say, okay, take this thing right here. That's the same thing as y, 
So let's plug that sucker right in there. X plus V can be placed wherever you see a Y. So this was true by substitution. I guess substitution is one word. Now, in the last class, we proved that the associative law holds. You can pick up these parentheses and reshuffle them to these second terms. And now, take a look. We arrived at this nonsense that theorem 7 says that a number can never equal that same number plus another. But that's exactly what we have here. So this is nonsense by theorem 7. Theorem 7 says, if you have a number, you can't ever equal that number plus another number. And so, Theorem 7 doesn't allow this, so we throw this property out that if you assume that 2 and 3 both hold, you get nonsense. So you say, screw that. I'm not going to allow 2 and 3 to occur simultaneously. Okay? So we're done with the first part of the proof that says that out of these three cases, um, if one is true the other two cannot be true. If one of those is true, the other two cannot be true. The hard part in this proof is showing that um, if you pick up any two natural numbers, that one of those has to be true. Okay, so all that we've shown is that if they're true, they can't occur simultaneously. Now we have to show that pick up any two natural numbers, one of them has to be true. Okay. So a little bit of a delicate proof here. Um, let me just make sure I get it right. Part of what makes it a delicate proof is how you define M. We're going to define M to be the set of all Y values where one of these three conditions holds. I think every time we've done a proof by induction, I've said the same thing, which is we're assuming that M is a set of all Y values where one of those three holds, right? For all we know, M could be empty, right? For all we know, 
maybe no natural numbers satisfy this. So it's our job to verify that, yeah, I mean, we, we know. <laughs> but it's our job to verify that, first of all, there has to be something where one of these three properties hold, right? And so what's it going to be? We're going to say that whenever y is 1, one of them has to be true, okay? And that's, you know, I'm repeating myself intentionally just to show you that once you understand proof by induction, it works the same for all of them, right? Define m to be the set of all numbers where the property holds. Show that it holds for 1. Show that it holds for all successors of items in m. And then m has to be all naturals. Okay. So whenever y is 1, it's going to be one of those numbers where one of those three properties holds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you could think of this as saying, yeah, I mean, you, you get it, right? Okay. <laughs> I don't want to confuse, uh, confuse you anymore. Okay. So we want to make sure that no matter what x is, that we can always say that y, y equal to 1 satisfies one of these properties. So what we do is if x is equal to 1, then equation 1 holds. I'll just put one check mark, meaning I did. Exactly. We're doing two different cases. You, you say, okay. Well, yeah, exactly. So in the case that y is equal to 1, we have a couple different cases. x could be 1 as well, or x could be different from 1. And so we say, let's look at that one case first. We're assuming y is 1, and now there's the case that x could also be 1. Then equation 1 holds, and therefore y is somewhere in that list. Right? y satisfies equation 1. And if x is different from 1, then x is equal to b successor by theorem 3. So again, going all the way back to theorem 3, it says that if you're different from 1, then you have a predecessor. If x is different from 1, then x has a predecessor. So we say, hey, take a, look at this. take a look at this. Whenever x is not 1, theorem 3 guarantees that there's some number that comes before that succeeds to x, right? So what does that mean? It's a subtle proof, but it's pretty as well. Okay. What does that mean? That x is equal to B successor which is equal to 1 plus B but what was 1 1 was Y and therefore Y satisfies this property that if y is 1 and x is arbitrary, then it satisfies this equation too. It says that pick up any arbitrary x, then if y is 1, you can represent x as y plus some number. Right? Here it is. x can be thought of as y plus some number. Okay? 
So that says, if y is 1, then you're in one of these two cases. And so we're done with that very first step of the induction. Prove that it holds true for y equals 1. Right? Now, let's do the inductive assumption. Where we say, pick up any element of M. When we do these induction proofs, I always, I always tell you, you have, to, you have to keep in mind what M is, right? In this case, M is the set of Y values where one of these three things holds. Right? That was the definition of M. So what do we do? We picked up something where one of these three holds. And now we have to show that Y successor is also an M, meaning Y successor satisfies one, right, equation one, or equation two, or equation three. Okay, and if we assume that y satisfies one of these three equations, and if we assume that all successors to y satisfy one of them, then the inductive hypothesis, or axiom 5 rather, shows that all y will satisfy one of these three conditions. Okay. So it's not a pretty proof. There are pretty parts of it, but it's kind of a piecemeal type of thing. Um, what we have to do is we say, okay, assume just for the moment that what if equation 1 holds? so that x is equal to y. Okay, because that's what we were doing here. We said, let y be such that one of those three equations holds. Let's just pick up one of the cases. Case one is that maybe the first one holds, okay? Then I'm going to use this little term here. NTS means need to show. Need to show. We need to show that one or two or three holds. For, for Y successor. So we're assuming that we're in case one, meaning that X and Y were the same. And therefore, we know that the successors are going to be the same. And what does this mean? 
This means that, I guess I should have it the other way around, x plus 1 has to equal y successor. But what does that mean? That means that um, equ uh, equation 3 holds. So the bird's eye view perspective on this little proof that we just did said, let y be such that this holds. Take that equation and replace it with a, with a successor, right? Well, successor both sides. Then you land back in this chart somewhere, right? You get y successor has to satisfy equation 3, right? That's all that we did. We said assume that equation 1 holds, take successors on both sides, then you, bam, land back in that chart where y successor satisfies equation 3. Okay? So if you started in that chart and you take a successor, you land back in that chart. All right. All right. So I'm going to put a little line here saying that we're done with that case. That if you start at x equals y, you start with the assumption that y equal to x will give you another equation in this chart. y successor will be x plus 1. Okay. So now let's move on to the second case. The second case says, suppose that y is such that this equation holds. He says, suppose that y is such that this equation holds. Uh, we're out of time. Damn it. This is the hard one, too. Um, I'm going to go till that says 321. So, um, no, this one, this one's a little bit too. <laughs> this, this one's a little bit too. Uh, subtle for this for like a one minute thing so um, no what we've done is we said if you start here 